Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We have a special guest with us today, and, and I, I can't say enough words about this special guest. He saved my life. He came into my life at a very crucial moment. I was going to walk away from ministry. I was going to, it was during the transition between me and my dad when I was taking over the church, and I was like done with the church and, and done with the things of God, and, and I was just going to go like work the secular world, become a mechanic, do something different. And um, we were at a, a conference together, and uh, Brandon found out that I have Pentecostal background, that we are raised, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, speaking in tongues, holy rollers, charismatic, all that fun stuff. And he's like, hey, I want to take you out to dinner. So we went out to dinner one night, sitting in this corner booth. He's like, so tell me your story. And I just vomited on him. I mean, it was like, not, not literally, but emotionally, I just let it go. I told him everything I hated about the church, not this church, but the church, everything I hate about pastors and preachers and, and the hypocrisy and, and, you know, I went in. And I was dogging everything. I was dogging the way I was raised. I was dogging Pentecostalism, everything. And he said to me, he goes, that was safe for you to talk to me that way, but don't ever talk like that again. And I was like, bro, do you know who you're talking to? Like, I'll punch you in your mouth. Right? Like, I'm a New Yorker. You don't tell me that. Like, in my mind. I didn't say that to him to his face. I honored that and respected him because we're like the same age. And for him to say something like that to me in authority and begin to kind of coach me through a healing moment um, as a lead pastor, it's something that I will be forever grateful for. And, and I'm committed to him. I'm committed to his ministry. I'm committed to his family to make the vision that God has in their heart come to life because of what he did in my life. In that moment, he says, hey, before you leave, I need to tell you, you need to read a book. It's called The Tale of Three Kings. And so I downloaded the ebook, and we were flying from Seattle, um, Scottsdale, Arizona, back to New York, and I read the book twice on the airplane. It, it, it has impacted me. It's something I go back and read every year. It tells you how to be a leader no matter your circumstances, no matter what's happening around you. And I really thought that I was right, but I had become wrong in being right in the transition time. A great book, The Tale of Three Kings. You can download it on Amazon. I'm probably going to go ahead and buy a case of them and have them here because I talk about it enough that we should have access to it. But Brandon and Lindsay uh, have been our friends from that moment, from that time. Uh, we, we stay in contact. We haven't had them in since COVID. I mean, it's been like, it's been wild, the journey that's been happening uh, in their life and in our life. They travel so much around the world um, training second chair leaders, people who are serving the vision of a pastor. And I honor that so much because as a lead guy, you're always wondering, well, who's trying to take my job? And so I can't give it away. I try to give it away. I can't give it away. But, but Pastor Brandon and Pastor Lindsay, they are so committed to raising up the next chair leaders to serve the kingdom of God and so, serve the local church. And I honor them so much. Would you stand on your feet and honor Pastor Brandon as he comes to the stage today? Good morning, Family Church. Hey, do me a favor. Will you stay standing for just a minute? Psych. <laughs> How we doing? Are we glad to be in the house of God on a Sunday morning? Anyone thankful to be here today? And Can I just like hang out here for a minute? Can we be family, family church? You know, um, I love your pastors. I'm thankful for kingdom-minded pastors, pastors that don't just see our four and no more. Um, so thankful that you all um, see beyond this house and invest. Um, so many nice things he just said, and I do remember that night in the booth and that angry pastor sitting across from me that night. <laughs> I do remember that. Um, What's so crazy, though, is a few years later, we would step out in faith, believing that God was going to use us in ministry to launch our ministry that's now called Leading Second, and it's sent us around the world. Um, 
and travel every week of the year helping somewhere to build leaders and build the house. But your pastor just so happened, your pastor, we were at the same conference about six years ago. It was the very first time in a room full of leaders I ever gave a message that kind of framed in our ministry for second chair leaders. And he was there that day, and I think he would echo. It was, it was, it was a powerful moment. It was, I could tell God was doing something. And from that day on, your pastor committed to us and said, I'm with you. Let's get this thing off the ground. So in case you don't know it, especially for those of you who give to this house, what you may not be aware of is you support uh, our ministry and ministries like ours every month with your giving. And uh, we've taken that and for the last six years. We've, we wake up every single day to put that investment to good use. God has sent us around the world. He has allowed us by his grace to train and impact um, churches across North America. Um, we have a podcast that is that reaches thousands of listeners every single week. We just held a conference with almost 100 churches at it. And I'm, I'm saying that not to brag. I'm saying that to say that this house has kingdom fruit everywhere because of your investment. So Family Church, a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Is anyone thankful for this house? Thankful for Family Church that God is raising up this house. Amen for such a time as this. So Pastor Mike, Cindy, I, I honor you. Thank you so much for being incredible. Thank you for, for being leaders that have shepherded faithfully, that have led us through a pandemic, that have stood for the name of Jesus. We honor you today. Help me honor your pastors and thank God for them today because they're good pastors. This is a good house. Amen. Amen. I hope you're ready for the word. If you would, lift your hands to heaven with me today. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, King Jesus, we love you today, Jesus. I'm thankful for your people. I'm thankful for your house, Lord. It's a beautiful house that you've raised up, that you've established, Jesus, for such a time as this. Thank you for how you've sustained this house. Thank you for the vision of this house that you've given us. I thank you the gates of hell will not prevail against this house, Lord. So we just thank you for it today. And Jesus, you've given me a word that I believe is going to build the house now. So we open up our hearts to you. We open up our ears to hear, our minds to receive. Holy Spirit of God, would you just breathe today on every heart. My prayer is that today you would stir up the gift on the inside of us. That you would stir up the ministry gift of this house, Lord. Position us, Jesus, well to be your hands and your feet to a world that desperately needs to see you in this hour. And we will be so careful today, Jesus, to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 All right. You may be seated. If you see someone else you'd rather sit by, go ahead and move. Now's your chance. <laughs> So good to be here, so good to be back, so good to see health and life in the house after what has been an interesting couple of years for all of us. Uh, good to have my wife in church with me. We're not always together on a Sunday morning. Give the pastor's wife wave if you would, Lindsay. There you go. She loves doing that. That's her favorite moment of the day right there. We've been married 18 years. Um, we have two daughters one is 11 and one is one because we're terrible at planning. <laughs> we have a teenage girl and a toddler girl. I'll let you figure out which is the bigger handful. Spoiler, it's not the toddler. <laughs> no, we have our 11-year-old. Uh, her name is Zane. She's in youth service right now. Uh, it's spring break for her, so where else would we be but in church together on spring break? It's awesome. Um, I've grown up in the same church my whole life, so 41 of my 42 years on planet Earth have found me in one church, under one pastor, one vision, and so receive me today as someone who just deeply, deeply loves the local church. I, I love the local church. I believe there is nothing greater 
on planet Earth. No greater community, no greater cause, no greater group of people than the house of God, than the people of God. Amen? Like people that have been brought out of darkness and into, into light. You know, the church isn't perfect. You know that, right? Anyone noticed? <laughs> church isn't perfect. Thank God that being perfect is not a prerequisite in the kingdom of God to being used by God. Our God specializes at using imperfect people for his perfect purpose. Amen? So, hey, church isn't perfect, but she's Jesus' body, and it's the bride of Christ, and we've just, we're just a couple that went all in years ago to building the church. So just receive us today as church members those who have kind of given our lives to love and build the house of God. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you would, Matthew 4 and 1 Corinthians 4. We're going to be in two scriptures today, Matthew 4 and 1 Corinthians 4. We're going to start in Matthew with some words of Jesus. And I believe um, by the Spirit of God, I'm believing that today we'll just stir your faith in a new way. Stir the gift that's on the inside of you. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18 as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. So they were exactly where they were supposed to be on this day. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. This was a day that changed everything in their lives. They received an invitation from none other than Jesus himself. Come follow me, but it didn't stop there. I will make you fishers of men. I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father, mind you. They're like, peace, Dad. <laughs> they left their boat and their father and followed him. I start us here today because I believe that there is an invitation in front of each one of us today that I'd like to talk about. It's an invitation to every disciple, to every believer. It's an invitation from Jesus himself. It's an invitation into purpose. It's an invitation that has been extended to God's people throughout history. It's an invitation so compelling that men and women have given everything to accept it and follow it. It's an invitation to walk in something new, and that invitation is an invitation into ministry. It's an invitation to be used by Jesus to advance his kingdom and build his church. I'm not sure if you've thought about it or not, but your life is stamped with purpose in the kingdom of God. Whether you are aware of it or not, there is a call of ministry on your life. An invitation by Jesus to you, not only to come follow him, but to be transformed in him, to be used by him. How many of you know that there is a world outside of these doors that desperately needs to know Jesus. There are people that woke up in this community today dying to know Jesus. They just may not know it yet. People that woke up in the worst spiritual condition of life. Can you imagine the last three years, can you imagine navigating what we've been through not knowing Jesus? I mean, just think about that. It's been, for those of us who are Christ followers, it's been tough enough. And, you know, we've got an anchor, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. We've got an anchor for our souls. 
My heart has been so moved in this season for those who don't know Jesus. And that has served to refire in me a commitment to do everything we can to see healthy, strong, thriving, life giving churches in every city, every community of this nation. I just wanted to remind you that Family Church is not here on accident. That Family Church is a church here on mission and on purpose with a, with a community to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've, I have this tortured relationship with this term, full-time ministry. Have you ever heard that term? The term full-time ministry. It, it, it's a term that we use to like refer to the church staff or something, or Pastor Mike or Cindy, you know, full-time ministry. I, I have been in full-time ministry, I guess, all my adult life for over 21 years, but I don't like that term full-time ministry uh, because I was unaware that there was a part-time option to being used by Jesus. <laughs> there was a part-time option to being a Christian. You know, to, to be a Christ follower is to be in ministry, and today I just want to show you a lens to all this that has meant so much to me in my life. I want to show you and share with you the invitation into ministry that changed everything for me a few years ago. Would you flip now to 1 Corinthians chapter 4? In verse 1, we're going to camp out here for a few minutes. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. First of all, a little context here. This is the Apostle Paul writing, the great church builder. He's writing to the church in Corinth. This is a church that he founded, a church that sees him as kind of a father in the faith. You know, dad's writing here. And uh, the house got a little messy while dad's been away. And so uh, dad's writing to clean up the house. That's what 1 Corinthians is. Dad's saying, this is what orders the house. Let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 now. He he gets to the subject of leadership, of church building. And he says this, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ. Someone say servants of Christ. As servants of Christ and stewards. Someone say stewards. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then he goes on to say, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Servants of Christ, I just want you to see this for a minute. Servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Let's start here. The gospel is a great mystery. It's a mystery. Ever try to work it out exactly? How does it work? <laughs> that through faith in Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness for our sins and eternal life. I mean, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. The, the, the apostle Paul refers to it that way in Ephesians chapter 3. He said it's the mystery made known to us. It's the mystery of Christ, the mystery that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. I mean, it's a mystery that a sovereign God, a holy God, would come to an earth that he created in human form to seek and save broken humanity. It's this beautiful, beautiful mystery that has turned the world upside down for 2,000 years. It's a mystery that sinful people could be reconciled to a holy God through faith in his son. It's a mystery. We've now been adopted. Into, come on, is anyone just overwhelmed like I am and thankful for this beautiful, beautiful mystery that we're a part of? Christ Jesus now in us, saved and brought out of darkness and into light. I pray this is never lost on us. For those of us who have been in church a few decades, I pray this is never lost on us. Just think about today where your life would be if it wasn't for Christ. Like my life, I don't know about you, my life would be in a ditch somewhere if it wasn't for Christ. But he saved us, the Bible says. He called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his goodness and his 
grace. Let me say it like this. Our churches are a mystery. How did all of you end up in this same room together this morning? Think about that. Different backgrounds. Different stories. I love this room, by the way. My church is a diverse church. Like, this looks like heaven to me. Like, like, like so many different nations, so many different backgrounds, so many different stories here. But how did you all end up here exactly? It's a mystery. Like, you just, you're telling me you just so happened to meet somebody that invited you, and you ended up coming to this church that has meant so much to you. Like, that's anything but coincidence. That is God at work, the grace of God available for your life, that he found you a home, and he found you a family, and he found you a house to be a part of. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. For the last 2,000 years, the church has moved forward because men and women found their place in that mystery. The church has moved forward on the backs of the most selfless, sacrificial men and women the world has ever known because for 2,000 years, men and women have picked up the cause of Christ and said, I will do everything I can to see to it that this thing moves forward on my watch. We are servants of Christ and we are stewards of the mysteries of God. Okay, I want to break this down. There's something you need to see here today. First of all, the Apostle Paul calls us servants of Christ. The word servant in the original language, the Greek, it, Paul would have had a few words for servant available to him. The word that he chose is a word that sort of means like a free man or a free woman who voluntarily takes on a servant posture. A free man or a free woman who voluntarily makes themselves low, kind of like the under rower of a ship. In other words, this servant that's mentioned here, the word that he uses, is not an indentured slave. It's not someone who's obligated to serve. Not someone who's hired to serve. This is a free man or a free woman who voluntarily makes themselves low to row, to see to it that the thing that they're a part of moves forward. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that awesome? Like, I don't know about you, I am so dang grateful for Jesus. I am so dang grateful for his house and his people, the people that have spoken life into me when I needed it, the house of God that raised me up. Like, I am so dang grateful for that. I could spend the rest of my life, like I could do a lot of things. You could do a lot of things. But I, I would spend the rest of my life taking on a servant posture just to see to it that the church moves forward. That's what he's saying there. We are servants of Christ. You could do a whole lot of things with your Sunday morning, but you chose to be in God's house today. There are people that are running camera, greeting us. We're serving our children. Thank God for our children's ministry this morning. Amen. Like they are serving so you could be in here without your toddler <laughs> or your moody teenager. <laughs> Come on, we are servants of Christ. That seems like it could be enough to me. Doesn't it seem like enough? I'm so grateful to Jesus. I could spend the rest of my life just doing that. We're servants of Christ. But here's what I want you to see, is he doesn't stop there. So he says, we're servants of Christ, and we're stewards of the mysteries of God. So what's a steward? Because I don't know about you, it's practically my last name, but I don't really use that word a lot otherwise. It's, we're, we're stewards. What does that mean? What's their context for that word? Well, a servant was like an under rower. A steward was an under owner. Here's what I want you to see. In, in their context, a steward would have been someone who was placed over a house to manage the house on behalf of a master, on behalf of an owner. In other words, a master, an owner, would entrust his household to the management of a steward. And while the master was away, the steward was in charge. 
the steward would own. And and here's the kicker. He wasn't the owner, but he acted like the owner. (laughs) He wasn't in charge, but he was entrusted in that moment to be in charge. To the master, the steward was a servant. But to the other servants of the household, the steward was a master. This is where I found in Scripture the basis for our ministry, leading second, leading from the second chair. You can lead when you're not in charge. But what I want you to see today is that's a picture of the church. Think about it. Our master, King Jesus, he's away right now. And while King Jesus is away, guess what? You have been entrusted with stewardship. In other words, there is now responsibility on your life. We are, we're servants of Christ, but we're also responsible for this thing. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. In other words, for the last 2,000 years, this thing's been moving forward, family church. For the last 2,000 years, the seed of the gospel, what was a mustard seed planted 2,000 years ago, has now grown into this incredible plant, this incredible movement that has it now spans almost every nation of the world, every continent of the world. For the last 2,000 years, the most selfless men and women who have ever walked this planet have seen to it that the church move forward on their watch. But think about it. Men and women who would rather give their life than deny Jesus. Men and women who would smuggle Bibles across borders. Men who, who, who risk their lives translating the Bible into new languages. Men and women who have faithfully pastored churches and planted churches. Men and women who have served in churches. Come on, we are servants of Christ. Are you getting this? But we are we're stewards. We're owners of this thing while King Jesus is away. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. Family church, you've been entrusted with something. You've been entrusted with a moment. You've been entrusted with opportunity, something to do for the kingdom of God. Here's my question for you. Will you be found faithful with this moment? Jesus Christ himself has invited you into stewardship of the mysteries of God. Will you be found faithful? faithful. This shows up again in Matthew chapter 25. You don't need to turn there. Matthew chapter 25 verse 14 is the parable of the talents. Do you know this one? It's it's a parallel to the verse we just read. Matthew chapter 25, you know the parable if you've been around church, been around the word. Jesus tells this story, a fictional story of of a master who entrusted talents, that's not like a skill. Talents would be like a measure of money. It would be like resource, opportunity, if you will. The master entrusts opportunity to his servants, to when he gave five talents, to when he gave two talents, to when he gave one to each according to their ability. And then it says the master goes on a long journey. Remember, King Jesus is away right now. And he goes on a long journey and... While the master is away, the servants are busy. The servants are at work stewarding what they had been given to do. You know the parable, the one that received five made it ten. The one that received two made it four. And there was a day where the master returned. And he, I'm paraphrasing, but he asked a very simple question. What did you do with what I gave you to do? Like the opportunity, the resources. What did you do with what I gave you to do? The one that received five, made it ten. He heard those words I long to hear. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a little. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. The one that received two, pretty interesting, Made it four. He also heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. Side note, we should never compare ourselves among ourselves in the kingdom. Amen? Think about how easy it would have been for the one that received two talents 
to look at the one that received five and say, well, I guess I'm not as important as that guy. I mean, think about it. Some of you, your starting point in the kingdom might have you feeling inferior. You might feel like you've been dealt a really bad hand in life. You might feel not as talented as the next person. You might feel like I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I don't have enough, the right pedigree, the right, the right talent. I want to remind you that kingdom economics are completely upside down, the economics of this world. That in the kingdom, it is not about where you start. In the kingdom, our, it is about what you do with what our God has given you to do. Just think about it, because the one that received two and made it four, the one that received five and made it ten, guess, guess what? Both received the same reward. In the kingdom, it's not about where you start. It's about what you do with what you have been given to do. I wonder today if you can see what's in your hand. I wonder today if you can see what's been entrusted to you. How many of you know churches like this don't just happen, like, automatically? You do know that, right? Like, for decades, this house has been built by faithful men and women, faithful families. I mean, think about it. That chair you're sitting in today, you're sitting on someone's vacation. You ever thought about that? Think about it. Years ago, we probably did some kind of a building campaign. And someone got up on the stage and said, let's buy some chairs. Because if we can buy the chairs, if we can build the building, guess what? People are going to come in and receive Christ. And somewhere years ago, there were men and women that said, you know what? I'll give. Even if it means i got to go without Starbucks for a month. Even if I have to delay that trip to Disney World, this is what happened that built this church. Faithful men and women that said, I would, I'd rather. If my sacrifice translates into someone knowing Jesus, sign me up for sacrifice all day long. Like we are servants of Christ. Are you getting this today? And we are stewards. But just like the stewards in the parable they were all given something, but then they were all held to account for what they had been given. There will be a day where we stand before Jesus and we will answer, family church, we will answer that question, what did you do with what I gave you to do? I pray in this moment, I pray today, by the Spirit of God, that you would see the invitation into ministry that is on your life. I pray that you would see that regardless of your starting point, there is a significant contribution for you to make into the kingdom of God. I pray that you would see what God has given into your hands. And I pray that this church would be found faithful. Remember our verse we started with in 1 Corinthians. It's required in stewards that one be found faithful. You know, guys, at the end of the day, the goal of this whole thing, it's not to build a big church. It's not to build a cool church. It's not to build an Instagrammable church. You do know that's not the goal, right? Our goal is to build a faithful church. A church that is a faithful witness to the love and grace of God to a world that desperately, desperately needs to see Jesus. A confused world needs a powerful church. A confused world needs a faithful church. It needs a church on mission and on purpose. Can I show you one more thing before we go today? Well, let me say this. Let me say this. This is the second service. Can I take, like, just a second? Are we good? Are we good? Okay. As has been mentioned, we had, we have a toddler. Um, she was a COVID oops. <laughs> Not supposed to say oops. I'm supposed to say COVID surprise. Thank you. Thank you, mamas. She is what happens when you go from traveling 
275 days a year to staying home for seven months. I haven't quite figured out what happened, but that equals pregnancy. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, so, found out we were pregnant. We were driving one car at the time. I mean, we had just kind of sunk everything into our traveling ministry. Mama said, I need a proper mom car. I'm 40 and pregnant. Didn't expect to be pregnant. I want a proper mom car. I said, I'm on it. I got you. So I went out and I bought us a new car. I love buying a new car. Don't get to do it very often. Only, only a couple times. I love it. Like the new car smell. Like you drive that sucker off the lot and it's yours, right? So it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. I'm... I'm the guy with the unlimited car wash membership on the car. Like, I'm the guy who vacuums the trunk. Like, I'm the guy who, you know, details the car. I'm the guy that has, like, food rules in the car. Like, you don't, you don't bring food into Dad's car. Why am I like that? Why am I like that? Because it's my car, right? Because I own it. I have to make a car payment. I own it. It's mine. And therefore, like I take care of it. I have pride in it. My family has to get in it. You know? Let me tell you this. I have never one time detailed a rental car. Ever drive a rental car? I'm driving one right now. You will take a pothole at 100 miles an hour in a rental car and not give a rip about that thing. Right? Why? Why? It's not yours not yours. What's my point? There's a difference between owning something and renting something. I wonder today, do you own the vision of this house like a steward or are you renting the vision of this house? Like, do you own this? Because the call to stewardship is a call to ownership. Sure, it's not ours, but our master's away. And right now, while he's away, he's entrusted us, family church, with a moment. We're owners, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. Are you renting this thing, or do you own it as if it were your own? Okay, let me show you one more thing before I go today. Recently, it hit me. I was reading in the book of Acts, and it hit me. That, you know, there's certain names that get a lot of credit. There's Paul, there's John, there's Peter. A lot of names you've heard a lot of sermons on over the years. But it hit me. There's a lot of believers that are named in Scripture. They're mentioned in passing. You know, the Bible writers would greet this person or greet this person. And I started thinking, those people were church members. They were church members. They were a part of churches. I decided to look every single one of them up. I just wanted to see who were these people. What did they do? Can I show you their names? I look, we're going to put them up on the screen for you. I looked up every single one of them. This is every named believer from Acts chapter 2 to Revelation chapter 2. Every named believer. Just look at it. Men and women who were faithfully a part of local churches in the first century. Now, here's what I wanted you to see. We can just keep this up here for a minute, guys. Here's what I want you to see. Look at those names. You've never heard a sermon on most of those names. You probably don't know who most of those people were. I sure didn't. Never heard of most of these people. But here's what I know. Out of the tens of thousands of people who were a part of the early church, these ones were called out in Scripture. They were called out for some reason. Many of these people, we had no idea what they did. But you know what? I believe they were faithful. They were servants of Christ. They were stewards of the mysteries of God. I mean, look at it, church members. This is our heritage. This is where we come from. This is the line of people who started the whole thing that we're now stewards of. You may not know their name. You may not know their story, but you've been impacted by their life. 
You've been impacted by their service. And just think about it. If you were to take your place, if you were to say, you know what, I'm going to serve the purposes of God in this house. I'm going to accept Jesus' invitation to ministry. Like you could be this person to somebody else. Because we're servants of Christ. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. Can I tell you about a couple of them really fast? Is that okay? Can I tell you about Phoebe? Phoebe was a part of the church in Corinth. Or a suburb of it, anyways. She is listed in Scripture as a sister, a deacon, and a patron. Side note, don't ever tell me that women can't significantly be used by God in leadership, by the way. She was a deacon in the church. But I want you to see that she was a woman of means. She, had, she was able to financially contribute to the church. But you know what she did that was so remarkable? She personally delivered the book of Romans to Rome. It was an 800-mile journey. She financed it, and she took it. You've probably never heard a sermon on Phoebe. But you know what? You've been impacted by her life. You've been impacted by her service. We, we have the crown jewel of Paul's writings because of Phoebe. She was a servant of Christ. She stewarded the mysteries of God. Her seat, her role in the kingdom. I could tell you about Aquila and Priscilla. A couple, they met Paul in Corinth. They were tent makers. Paul worked with them in their business. They connected on such a level when Paul went to plant the church in Ephesus, he took them with him which we believe they stayed at for the rest of their lives. They were zealous for Christ. They were zealous for doctrinal accuracy, which was important because, remember, they didn't have this yet. They didn't have canonized scripture, so accuracy was important. In Paul's final letter in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul kind of greets him from prison. His final words that we know of. Hey, say hi to, say hi to Aquila. And Priscilla for me, kind of a hello from prison to my faithful church building friends. All those years later, they were still in Ephesus, faithful to the call of God on their lives. I could tell you about Epenetus. Epenetus, he was the first convert for the church in Asia. I love that this church has leadership in its mission statement. Talk about having to be a leader. Like it's bad enough in just our everyday life. He was the first convert for Christ for an entire continent. Can you imagine what stewardship looked like for him? But he's faithful. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Are you getting this today? I could tell you about Archippus. Archippus was kind of a campus pastor at the church in Colossae. He was referenced by Paul as a fellow soldier. I love that. A fellow soldier. I could tell you about Epaphras. Epaphras was also from the church in Colossae. He was a teacher in prison with Paul. He was eventually martyred. When Paul references Epaphras, he calls him a faithful servant in Christ. Paul only used that designation for one other man, and that was Timothy, who he raised up. A faithful servant in Christ. I could tell you about Lydia. Lydia was a businesswoman who converted to Christianity as a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew. She was from Philippi. She hosted Paul and Silas in her home. And she was known as a worshiper of God. I could tell you about Clement. This is a big one. If, and this is a big if, if the Clement mentioned in Philippians chapter 4 is the same historical Clement, which we believe that it is, then Clement, who was like in his mid-twenties at the writing of Scripture, Clement would go on to be a bishop of the church in Rome. In other words, like one of the first popes. <laughs> I want you to think about that for a minute. At the writing of Scripture, toward the end of Paul's life, you have a kid sitting in church. Oh, I feel the Spirit of God on this one. There, there is a kid sitting in church who's like 26 years old. 26 years old with a call of God on his life, stamped with purpose, stamped with ministry. Like it makes me wonder when I look out at a beautiful room like this, makes me wonder who's in the room right now. Who's in your mid-20s? You're just sitting here. You're just 
cooking, but like Jesus is doing a work in you. You're called to ministry. You're called to service. You're called to do something great for him. It just, just makes me wonder who's here. No one would have known that at the time, but he was a steward of the mysteries of God. One more. I could tell you about Persis. Persis was a woman in the church in Rome. You want to know what we know about purpose? Or pers per Persis, sorry, not purpose. You want to know what we know about Persis? Nothing. We know nothing about her. Do you want to know how she's described? She worked hard for the Lord, is what Paul said about her. Just think about that. All her life went down in history for is she worked hard for the Lord. Like, I wonder, would you be willing to be found faithful if all that was said of you was he worked hard for the Lord? She worked hard for the church, for the things of God. Are you seeing this family church? We are servants of Christ, and we are stewards of the mysteries of God. This thing's in our hands now. Will you be found faithful with your moment? Will you stand to your feet with me today? And I want to hold us just for a minute. No one moving, if you would. Because it's, I, I believe it's in these moments that the Holy Spirit draws us and calls us. Would you join me? Would you lift up your hands to heaven one more time? Would you go to that place that only you and the Lord have? Jesus, I thank you for this beautiful house. I thank you for every believer in this room. We just make commitments all over this room today. We are, we are servants of Christ. We take that on today, Lord. But much more than that, Jesus, we're also stewards. We're owners of this thing. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. I pray that each one in this room would see their part that they have to play. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would show us what you've put in our hands, the opportunity you've given us to serve you, the resource you've given us, the talent you've given us, the opportunity you've given us. May we have eyes to see it. Holy Spirit, right now, would you fan into flame the ministry call? Would you fan into, fan into flame the gift of God that is on the inside of everyone in this room today, Lord? Like you've transformed my moment, my life in these moments. May you do the same again here today. And Father, my prayer over family church in this season, such a vital and important season, my prayer over this church is that we would be found faithful. We just make commitments all over this room. We will be found faithful in your sight. That we might, we might do something for this city, that we would see a city, a community turned upside down by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will be so careful to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and amen, amen, amen. One more moment as you stay standing. I want to be a good steward of this moment as well. If you're here today and you've never been able to steward the opportunity of making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, then let's go ahead and do that today. Let's make today the day of salvation. If you're watching online or you're in the room and you've never had that opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let's go ahead and, and go for that today. And you repeat that prayer after me. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, thank you for accepting me into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.